So then you, you get into the Marines. Did you, did you serve whilst you was in the Marines? Do you have to serve to do the, the special forces? Yeah, I went. To, I mean, I joined the Royal Marines and um, I got through 32 weeks of training. This is back in 1989. I joined up. 32 weeks of training. I actually passed out finally. And the proudest moment for me was, you know, seeing, seeing my mum there and her watching me, you know, pass yeah, pass out and, and get my green beret as a Royal Marine commando. You know where. You know, seeing how much trouble I got into as a kid, many people, even the police, were like, you'll be back. You know, they'd kind of written me off already. But I wasn't, and it must have been, a, it was such a proud moment for my mum that day, seeing me pass out as a Royal Marine Commando. Um, from there, I went straight over to Northern Ireland. And that was, that, that was a big, that was probably my biggest shocker, to be quite honest, because when I joined, there was a brochure. And in my brochure, there was, Young men in uniform looked pristine, and I just thought, God, all the chicks will love that. <laughs> and then I saw another guy who was like windsurfing on a little holiday in the Caribbean or somewhere, and nothing prepared me for Ireland. You know what I mean? Ireland, although they called it a conflict, it was a war. It's, it's, it's a war. People are trying to work, and I consider that's quite black and white. If someone's trying to kill you, and you're going to do what you can to defend yourself and kill them if, if necessary, then that to me is a war. I don't care what you call it. But getting out there, you know, Northern Ireland, um, the, first, the first couple of nights in, um, we were on a quick reaction force. So anything that happened in the region, we would jump on a helicopter, go straight out there, deal with it. And um, I was, when I look back now, I was 19 years old. I mean, geez, I can't imagine my son at war. You know, it's just like, I can't believe I was that young. And um, that first night we got in, something had happened, a bomb had gone off. We were straight onto the helicopter, straight out. And um, the, IRA, the IRA had uh, had driven a, a, a truck bomb or a car bomb into a checkpoint. Totally obliterated the whole of the checkpoint. It was a 500 pound bomb. And the, off, the offcoming guard, which was the cold stream guards, that it killed about five or six. But I can always remember we got down on the ground and one of our sergeants got out, Sergeant Clare, and he was like, um, he'd been to the Falklands. He was pretty, you know, hardened and those kind of things. We were still in a state of shock. There was just mayhem everywhere. And um, I can remember he gathered, gathered everyone in and he booted something on the floor. He said, we need to see if we can find any more of these. And we looked down, it rolled. And as it stopped, it was a head inside a helmet. And that for me was like, that wasn't windsurfing on the beach. You know what I mean? That was like my first introduction as a young boy to war. That's where I crossed that bridge. And it was a bit of a shock, really. A, sh a hell of a shock, actually. Um, and then we had a pretty, after that, you know, we had a pretty colorful, they tried 19 times to kill us. Um, didn't succeed, but um, it, was, it was an interesting tour. But one thing I did learn on that, which kind of changed my view, and I think this was really, when I look at it, it was the catalyst for me wanting to join the Special Forces. I can remember looking across the ground one day and I don't know why I had it, it was just like an epiphany. It was just like something that came into my head. And they used to give us all these sort of tasks, all these missions every day to go and do. And I sat there one day and I went, there are no tasks, there are no missions, we're bait. And that's, to this day, I still believe that. You know, we're bait, we're being put on the ground because they want the IRA to attack us and then from that, that's where they build their intelligence. You know, the activity creates the intelligence picture. So for me, it was like, I just thought I'm just cannon fodder. It wasn't sharp enough. It wasn't the sharp, it wasn't the sharp, it wasn't, the, you know, I needed to be on the sharper end of this, end of the spear, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so I kind of lost a little bit of interest from that point on. You know, it kind of devalued me. It was just, I felt like cannon fodder. So when we got back from that, we, you know, we went on two weeks leave, or not two weeks, it was like six weeks leave, but it got caught sh cut short. And then we got called over to Iraq, uh, Operation Desert Storm. And again, that was, although we had, a, there was a few things, we went to the, the village, we went into some of the villages in the mountains where the Kurds were, and some, there were some atrocities done, you know, some things that I, I, I can't even describe to this day. Um, done to the to the Kurds up in the mountains. So again, that was a shock. Uh, but you know, it's it's part of the uh, part of the education. 
you know, it's part of my indoctrination into that, that world. But I came back from there, you know, and although it had high, you know, certain things happened and it was great, it wasn't enough, it just wasn't enough. And it got to that point where I started to lose belief in myself. And the whole, just the, just the thought that I, I could be in the special forces, I thought, nah, that's, that's not, I'm not I'm prepared to, to embark on that journey. I just didn't believe in myself enough. And I put my notice in to leave at that point. You know, I'd had enough. And I think I had six months left to do, even less than that. And I ended up bumping into my former officer from who I served with in Iraq. And uh, he was at my brother's pass out. My brother passed out as a helicopter pilot. He was a brainy one. And um, I saw him there and he said, what are you up to? I said, well, I'm leaving. And he said, no, are you kidding me? And I said, yeah, I said, it's not for me. And he says, mate, he said, you've got something. I don't know what it is, but you've got something. I believe you've got what it takes for the special forces. If you leave now, you regret that for the rest of your life. And those words from someone that I respected changed me, changed me straight away, you know, inspired me. Someone gave me a bit of confidence when I was lacking it. And that was phenomenal. And that gave me just that little inch of confidence to change my whole mindset and think. And just the thought of you will regret that for the rest of your life. They're powerful words, really powerful words. And if it wasn't for him saying that, I wouldn't be sat here today and I wouldn't, I'd be leading a very different life, whatever that would be. Um, but that was the one turning point. I then went and got back. I, I took out my notice to leave. And within a month or two months, I was down at Hereford starting Special Forces Selection. One of the youngest lads there. Crazy. Um, I, I want to touch on the Special Forces, but just just uh, briefly, mm. those first two tours, you, you had already started working on your mindset. Obviously, you're at war, like you're starting to work on your mindset. Um, for me, when, like, as a normal civilian, I'm thinking if I was in that situation, I don't, I'd be thinking about being at home all the time. And, I'm, and you've spoke about mm. this, like, you trained your mind to never go to that place. Mm. What other things were you do using um, your mind and, and how, how was you using your mind when you was at war to sort of get through those times? To be honest, when I look back now, I realise that I think I have always been that way orientated and I don't know why it is, but still to this day, I mean, it wasn't something I was conscious of. It's like all about mindset. It was just something that came naturally to me. But really, I mean, the thing with war, um, the, the one thing I managed to always, and I've always done this for whatever reason, is I, I, don't, I don't get lost in the journey. It's always, always has been the vision of who and where I want to be. So whether that came to missions, you know, in Iraq or, or in Northern Ireland, it was about where I wanted to be. It was the visualization of what we wanted to create the end result. And that for me was always the anchor that pulled me forward. So regardless of what happened in here, I've always had a mission, a goal. We, we were mission driven anyway, and we were always given a mission on the ground. It was that mission, that goal that I would always focus on. Because if you don't have a focus on a goal or a mission, and this is generally in life, you will find that you end up becoming a victim of your circumstances. You get lost in the journey. Something happens, something major happens, and you become a victim of your circumstances because you've got nothing bigger pulling you through. So really, for me, it's all, always been about the fact that I visualize where I want to be when times are tough, when times are hard, when things are going really wrong. I visualize, I've got a vision of where I want to be, and it's that one thing that pulls me through, and I don't get bogged down in the situation.